Okay, so my um, my sound recorder thing is on, but I need to get a level. So if anyone can just do a big boo at me, that would be really good. So, um, well, thank you for the warm welcome. Um, I, um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is uh, Hayden, and um, I'm an actress, a singer, and a model, and. Uh, of course, in HTML5, I wouldn't have to put the equals true in there. I would just put the attribute on there to reflect the characteristic. If it's there, it's true. If it's not there, it's false. So it's much simpler. It's to, so it saves bytes or something like that. When the television show Heroes jumped the shark for the 817th time, we stopped filming. And I decided to move to Norwich to have a quiet life as a designer. And I changed my name very slightly to Hayden Pickering. <laughs> uh, and uh, I also do a lot of uh, visual design. Uh, there's some of my work there which you'll be familiar with. Um, I didn't actually design that, but I did recreate it using um, Comic Sans, uh, because that is all it is. So um, I also do a lot of writing for Smashing Magazine. I don't know if anyone here reads their articles. Some of them were written by me. Most of the unpopular ones were written by me. Um, that is a picture of a croco duck, um, which has a strange legacy because I was asked to draw that, um, and it's part of the HTML 5.1 specification, that drawing of a croco duck now. So that's my tiny contribution to the uh, HTML specification. HTML 5.1 isn't actually the successor to HTML 5. That sounds really exciting, doesn't it? You say, well, you do HTML 5. I do HTML 5.1, so up yours. <laughs> it's actually just more like, if it was Git, it's more like the develop branch, and it gets merged back into master, which is HTML 5. This, is, this part of the, uh, the presentation is really just to put you at ease, because a lot of people think I am talking out of my ass. And uh, I call them my fans, sort of ironically. These are genuine comments I've received for some of the articles I've written about CSS. He didn't actually, he didn't qualify this at all. There was no qualification, there was nothing surrounding that in the text. It was just, it's difficult not to demonstrate anything in 4,000 words. Not anything at all, even if it's a thing bogus. But um, apparently I managed to pull that off. Uh, using a sort of popular cultural icon there to, uh, to really hammer the point home. I like that, that was nice. Um, so that's good. I get um, accused of being a troll quite a lot. Um, I've been accused of being a troll by a number of commenters, but also by the Web and HTML working group um, when I told them that I thought that block quote element should be deprecated. Uh, as another one. Uh, it's just a trendy way of saying what the last one said, really. Um, and this is my favourite. If there's nothing else, it's polite. <laughs> I completely disagree. Good day to you, and I think he was probably puffing a pipe as he said that. Um, and the reason that I get a lot of animosity from uh, people, if they're really people, they might be bots, I don't know, um, is because I talk a lot about my reservations um, about the class attribute and the class selector in CSS, of course, and how they correspond to each other. I'm a bit dubious about whether or not they're um, conducive to good web standards, and I'm hoping to explain today why that is. To do that, um, we're going to have to go back a long time to before, in fact, the web began, about 300 million years before. <laughs> and uh, for the purposes of an analogy, I want to talk about the shark and the octopus. Uh, there's two things we know about the shark and the octopus. The first thing is that they exist in the same context. The shark and the octopus both exist in the sea. In fact, uh, to be more specific than that, they actually both exist in just the warm parts of the sea. Um, but the other thing about them is that they look really different. Despite the fact that they are in the same sort of place, they look really, you've got your shark like that, and I suppose for want of a better word, the squiggly octopus. Now, a lot of people think that the reason they look different is because an intelligent designer, let's call him um, Mark Bolton, has decided that just basically on a whim, and more or less to just to demonstrate the power and the vigor of his creative mind, just said, look, well, I'm going to make a shark in my own image. And, of course, in the Bible, it doesn't mean make it look like Mark Bolton, but it's going to be his design. Uh, and I'm going to do an octopus as well. And I'm going to make them look different just to, basically to show off. But we all know that isn't actually really true. 
the reason that the shark and the octopus look different is because they have different adaptations to their environment. They, um, they look different because they have different physical attributes to facilitate different behaviours, etc. So it's all to do with evolution. And uh, this is one of my favourite quotes by a guy called Louis Sullivan, who's an architect. Um, it is the pervading law of all things organic and inorganic, of all things physical and metaphysical, that form ever follows function, this is the law. So what he's saying is that it can't be helped that things will look a certain way because of how they function and how they behave and what they're made up of. And it's really important if you're a designer to, um, to abide by that rule. If you're an architect and you just decide, I want to make a building which looks like this and you don't really think about the structural integrity of that building, you're going to kill a lot of people. And it's true of HTML as well. If we didn't get in there with our CSS and, and decide to change the way that things looked, um, user agents, browsers, etc., will all render things, um, render elements to look like what they are and how they behave and how they've been standardised to behave in order to be accessible and interoperable and all of those good things. So buttons look like buttons because they're buttons and links like links because they're links. Um, but people like Mark Bolton, myself and perhaps some of you, want to um, exercise their creativity and um, make things more um, idiosyncratic, I suppose, and put their personal touch on things. So, for instance, Mark Bolton might use his laser eyes <laughs> to turn the, uh, the link green. If for no other reason, then, then loads of people can write blog articles about how green design is the new design mode. So we had uh, concave, convex, flat, um, long shadow, green. And uh, how, do we do, how do we go about this? So originally, um, we went about that by creating more markup rules, which would facilitate those different design um, ideas. And so we had stuff which I suppose you could just call presentational markup, like the font tag and the colour attribute, which were just there to change the appearance of things. So in a way, you could say it was sort of like the best of both worlds. You had markup, which described meaning and uh, what, the, um, what machines should um, interpret it as. But at the same time, you allow the designer to exert their control. The problem with that is that it's just not really a very good idea. Because that's not what markup's for. Markup is to add clarity. Markup is to define and give more information about the content. It's not there to dictate how it should be presented. So the W3C, to confirm that fact and to sort of um, emphasise it for developers and authors of HTML, came up with this concept of the separation of concerns. So um, HTML should always um, allow separation of content and presentation. For this reason, markup that expresses structure is usually preferred to purely presentational markup. So a lot of these attributes and um, uh, elements got deprecated in favour of CSS. So what that allowed us to do was to create a separate style document which could then govern lots of remote um, documents of HTML. And that made things much more efficient and made things much more maintainable and a lot easier to do things. So a simple in, uh, selector, what I'd call an intelligent selector, would be something like the uh, A tag, or the, uh, sorry, the A selector for hyperlinks. It used to be anchor, but anchors are now deprecated, weirdly. So the fact that it's A is sort of oddly anachronistic. Um, and the cool thing about it, as simple as it is, and as, and as as much as you take it for granted, I'm sure, is that that will style taxonomically anything which is a link, and that's why it's intelligent. You don't have to go into the markup and change it manually, which simple but powerful thing. But added to that, you can do all sorts of other things uh, with more complex selectors. So in the first example, you have a link which belongs to a... Uh, NAV bar, so you might want to style that differently, so you're more specific based on the context. Um, following that, you have a link which, is, uh, which follows a small element, and then you can do stuff with um, pseudo classes as well. That will be a link which appears as the only child of a parent. And you can style things based on their functional, what I call functional attribution. 
uh, the first one there just tests to see if an attribute is there and the second one the specific value of an attribute and the third one the specific substring of an attribute so that uh, will start any link which is pointed to a secure page but we also got with all of this classes and I'm not sure why and they're very powerful and that's perhaps the problem with classes that they're there they're kind of too powerful. And the W3C is aware of this. And again, they're warning us off bad practice. CSS gives so much power to the class attribute that authors could conceivably design their own document language. Authors should avoid this practice since the structural elements of a document language often have recognised and accepted meanings. And this is very true. Um, classes don't affect anything. They only affect appearance, apart from perhaps micro formats. So to um, believe that they actually have a real impact on the workings, the true workings and the behaviours of um, your HTML is a bit of a uh, misnomer. However, despite that, we get lots of these um, frameworks which emerge <coughs> with these weird acronyms. Uh, BEM is one, then you have SMACARS, and there's also USUS, which um, they tend to call them methodologies, but they, they tend to, they, they also used in... Um, in frameworks. And what do they do? Um, let's have a little look at BEM on its own. I'm just going to use a little example. Uh, it stands for Block Element Modifier. And here's a little example from their documentation page. We've got a UL class equals menu there. That's sort of the uh, block. And then each LI there is called a menu item. Um, the problem here is that you're really going back to the days of using font tags and colour attributes because you have to go into your document and write this frigging class on every list item that appears in a menu. That seems counterintuitive to me and it seems to... Uh, it doesn't seem as powerful or as um, elegant as using real CSS. Um, it's redundant, of course, because you could just use a, a descendant selector. You could just do dot .menu li. Um, and you can't reuse any sort of style patterns that you've created there unless you actually go into the document that it's governing and put the classes in there manually, which is what we were trying to get away from in the first place by inventing CSS. It gets really awry and kind of a bit worrying when you consider that you could change the underlying actual markup. With the classes intact, it will still look like it's a, a list or it would look the same but the markup's different and this has real problems with um, assistive technologies and accessibility because that although it looks the same to a sighted uh, user of your application <coughs> will not actually be announced as a list you won't be told that you're entering a list you won't enter into list mode and the uh, list items will not be counted for you as you go in there so it will not say it's list two items. Okay, so <coughs> I do appreciate that you may, uh, a lot of you use BEM, and it is a really good way to make it easier to write and govern your CSS. The problem is it doesn't really answer the question of whether or not you're writing good HTML, right? And considering it's element agnostic in that it's using the class to define something visually rather than really and truly uh, speaking to what the HTML is. I think having element in the acronym is a bit misleading. You could use a much more generic term like unit. Now, <laughs> you can see where I'm going with this. So this, um, I was talking to one of my colleagues earlier. He was hoping that I'd cover this. <coughs> this is something called semantic UI. And this is based on BEM principles. Uh, BEM, the BEM methodology, so-called. Here is the um, definition of user interface. And I want you to bear this in mind when I talk about some of the, uh, some of the uh, reservations I have about semantic UI. The means by which the user and a computer system interact, in particular, the use of input devices and software. So a user interface is really this intersection between uh, computers and human beings. And it's, it's a place where they come to an agreement and understand it. <coughs> this is their um, example in their documentation for a stand what they call a standard button. 
Now the W3C have a standard button and the element is a button. <laughs> but they've decided that they're going to use a div with the class button, and this is some sort of fucking namespacing thing they're doing here, so just to sort of advertise it. You know when you used to get software, and you'd already installed it, but then you got the advert when you powered it up? Yeah, that's kind of what they're doing there. Um, <laughs> the problem is that when you... Um, bearing in mind, again, the, the, um, how user interfaces are defined. One of the great things about buttons being a standard is that we know that people will want to focus on those to use them. So people not using a mouse will ha um, who use a keyboard, for instance, screen reader users or anyone else who has motor difficulties or whatever, know that if they hit the tab key, they will focus onto the next button in the flow of the document. Uh, so <laughs> who can tell me what's going to happen when I press the tab key again? It's going to completely ignore the div which doesn't do dick all as far as a keyboard uh, user is concerned. So um, the whole concept of a user interface is broken down because you can't interface with what's there. OK. So what I would recommend, and what I like to do a lot of the time in my CSS, is use what I call conducive selectors. So what a lot of the people who come up with these kinds of class-based methodologies sell stuff like dot button on is that it's reusable. It doesn't have to be reusable because you should only ever put it on a frigging button. So if you just use the button selector, then that prohibits you from doing the wrong thing, right? So you only see what should look like a button if there's actually a button. Then you know just by looking that it's going to be accessible and uh, interoperable underneath. Okay, right. So <laughs> we've covered quite a lot so far, so I'm going to slow down a little bit. Um, so what have we covered? We've talked about sharks and octopuses. I've oh, sort of accidentally debunked 2,000 years of theology, and um, we've invented a framework called BUM. So now I just want us to imagine that, well, you can close your eyes if you like. We're on a beach, we're sitting on golden sand, we're looking out in the sea, it's very peaceful, and there's, there's some kids uh, playing on a banana boat. And you think, well, that looks like fun. And then you see a shark, and you think to yourself, I need to tell them that there's a shark in the water, this isn't good. So you step back and you think, what do I shout? Well, I shout shark, then I shout shark if there's a shark. So you, <laughs> and you're about to shout shark. And then you remember that you're a, you're a designer. And if you hadn't, if you'd been the one who'd invented the word, you probably wouldn't have used shark. You're not, like, you're not really keen on the sound of shark. So you start shouting fent because you think that's a better sounding word. It doesn't mean anything else, so it's available. Why not use that? And you start shouting, fence, fence, at these poor children. And, of course, something along those lines happens, which <laughs> no, no, no one wants. Uh, so I guess what I'm saying is that there's a whole generation of designers and developers who think that being semantic is making stuff up, which sounds good. Um, and that's not true. It's not true of the English language at all. If you uh, want to communicate something, you use words which already exist. And if you want to communicate something with HTML, you use elements which already exist. You don't decide that they're going to be called something else. And the problem with classes is that it allows you to do that, and it allows you to get carried away with doing that kind of thing. Can you, can you qualify that? Do you mean not just in HTML in the browser or not at all? Sorry. Um, yeah, you can make up words if you want. You could be like Kirch Fitters. You could be a, a sound poet, and you can just say things like blim and blam. It, but it's just irritating, and it doesn't help anyone. If you use the agreed words that we already have, or the agreed elements, then, um, well, that's what a standard is, right? Now, there's... Uh, there's, isn't, there's isn't HTML pretty forgiving when you don't follow the standard? Uh, to some extent, it's forgiving, yes. Uh, Not until you give it to it. But when you start doing accessibility testing, you find that if you're using divs for everything, it's unusable, you know, to people who use a keyboard or to... Uh, but yes, no, I, I, I appreciate that I'm, I'm sort of playing devil's advocate, if you like. Yeah, and there's room for using classes because there are some things which haven't been specified, and perhaps they should have done. So in a way, what you can do is you can use classes to say, well, this is how I do something. There should be an element for this. And that's how we got um, the footer element from the class footer or the ID footer. So whilst dot, uh, dot footer or class footer will never be, never be really um, standardised to the extent that it will ever be read out, say, with uh, a screen reader, 
the footer element will. The footer will be read out as footer or currently as content info. So, do you want to deprecate the div tag? Then? Uh, no, the div has um, really important um, purposes, I think, because it means nothing. It deliberately means nothing, which means it's really good for doing like grids and doing layout and stuff like that, because it's uh, because it's non-semantic. Now, what is the most semantic class name for a button? I'm open to any suggestions. Button. Button. <laughs> I think you're right. I think the <laughs> most semantic class name for a button is button. So all of that was wasted time, wasn't it, in a sense? Um, so if you're going to use your dot button, you can save just a byte and uh, just use the button selector. We've been here before. I'm sorry if I'm labouring my point, but we can, uh, we can agree on that, I think. But, and I do appreciate this, some people have more complex applications. You can't just use button because that'll make all of the buttons in your application look the same, right? So, and then someone did actually say to me, they complained about something I was saying about classes and said, I've got 20 button styles in my application. This is useless to me. You've got 20 button styles in your application. Your application is useless to me. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so... Um, but it's true. I mean, you can't just have but the same thing for everything. And of course, you should have descriptive text in your buttons for accessibility, apart from anything else. There has to be some sort of word in there or an ARIA label attribute, perhaps, if there isn't one. But there are um, standardised ways of um, describing specific types of buttons, and that's where attributes uh, come in. So we've already covered the disabled button. So if it's disabled, it's disabled. Now... When I talk about standards, I really mean this. It, you're governing actual behaviours across different platforms, different browsers, different devices. If you put disabled on a button, it will make it actually disabled. You'll no longer be able to focus on it, and as standard, without injecting your own CSS, it will be faded out or it will, it will appear disabled. Putting a class on it won't do any of that, not in itself. Um, so let's look at an example with um, SmackArse. Um, which stands for Scalable and Modular Architecture for CSS. It's sort of just the acronym itself seems to be overthinking CSS, or at least in my opinion. So using classes, how do we... Let's imagine we're making a tab interface. First of all, let's define a tab. The class doesn't define a tab. It makes it look like a tab, but it doesn't really define it as a tab. Is tab active defines the state, which is um, what you'd put on the tab to say that it's the tab which is, marks the open one, like the one which would appear in front. Now, that all looks good, but you could do that on divs or whatever. There's no indication that they'd actually be truly tabs, not to everyone, not to people who can't see, for instance. But you could use um, ARIA, um, which is the Accessible Rich Internet Application Suite, and use some of those um, roles, states, and properties to help. Um, role equals tab um, will actually convey that it's a tab to um, people who, who are using screen readers. I've qualified it with button. Now, the only reason I've done that is to force me to use an element which is focusable, as we discussed before. You can concatenate, like you do with classes, um, attributes like this. So we're making sure that it's a role tab before we use the area selected true to, sh to um, say that it's the, um, the one which is selected. Now, these aren't very well supported yet, it must be noted, but they are 100% more supported in the accessibility layer than classes. And you can see how it all comes together, and this is what I'm talking about, where you have an attribute, area selected, which defines um, an accessible state. It's also a styling hook, that's the selector, but also the sizzle selector engine can use it as well. The uh, myth that you should use classes if you're using JavaScript is indeed a myth, I believe, because the sizzle selector engine will take all sorts of uh, selectors. There you go. Uh, so in conclusion, right, so I'm nearly shut up now. Uh, yeah, okay, so what am I talking about? I'm talking about uh, designation, really. You can give names to things. So, for instance, our shark friend, you could call that shark Lydia, or you could call that shark... Uh, Susan, but it's really a sort of a moot point what their actual given name is. 
when they're biting your legs off. Um, and at the beginning, I did a little bit of a lie, and I said, well, I'm Hayden, but I'm glad that I'm Hayden Panettiere. And then I went on to say that actually, uh, I'm this guy who works as a web designer. And it's not a true statement when I just say, oh, this is my name, and I could change my job title as well. Um, none of these things are really true, unless they're really true, and it's the underlying truth which is important. So whilst I claim a lot of these things, I am at the end of the day that uh, girl you, that you watched on television uh, cavorting around in a pleated skirt. So thanks very much for listening. That's, that's my presentation.